Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be focusing on one individual rather than a single business, but she is more of a brand, and that's Lena Dunham. She does create businesses and content, so this episode isn't just going to be me sitting here attacking her, calling her a terrible person and all of that jazz, but I am going to try to take a look at all of her collective actions and works from as much of an unbiased perspective as I obviously can. I have seen videos about her in the past every once in a while when there's like a new scandal, but I wanted to take a look at who she is as a whole. Also, let me go ahead and put a content warning right here at the beginning of this episode. There will be mentions of sexual assault throughout today's episode. If you aren't up for hearing that and you're just not in the right frame of mind, I totally understand, but I wanted to make that clear from the get-go. So with that out of the way, let's get right into it. Who is Lena Dunham? Lena Dunham was born in 1986 in New York City. She began writing and acting at a young age in Brooklyn and studied creative writing at Oberlin College in Ohio. She got her start by producing short films online and according to Britannica, One such piece, The Fountain 2007, in which a bikini clad Dunham leaves her Rubenesque figure in a campus water feature, presaged the emphasis on body image in her subsequent work. Her efforts reached a wider audience when she launched a web series titled Tight Shots 2007 on the sex and culture website nerve.com. The series documented the farishal, hormonally charged efforts of a group of student filmmakers to depict the sexual awakening of a young Southern woman. In 2008, she graduated from Oberlin and in 2009, one of her films called Creative Nonfiction was shown at the SXSW Film and Music Conference in Austin, Texas. Her 2010 feature, Tiny Furniture, was also featured at SXSW and later picked up by a distributor, IFC Films, and received a theatrical release. Judd Apatow, a director and producer, saw her work and approached her about creating a television show, Girls. Girls made an immediate impression when it premiered in 2012. Many saw it as a sort of successor of HBO's previous series about the lives and loves of four New York women, Sex and the City. You'll find an absolute plethora of opinions online about this program. One source calls it a concoction of great writing, good acting, and bad sex. It goes on to state that there were moments when this review specifically wished bad things wouldn't happen to Lena's character, Hannah, simply because they knew the next set of episodes would be dedicated to Hannah victimizing herself. The New York Times says that it portrayed sex in a realistic way and that it was far more realistic portrayal of women and initiated a conversation about diversity. There's been plenty of unwarranted backlash as well, like when in early seasons, many would criticize Lena Dunham's body or weight and say they didn't wanna see her nude on television anymore. In 2013, Dunham's character Hannah was engaged to a wealthy, dreamy doctor, and some people criticized that Hannah wasn't hot enough to deserve a man as handsome as the dreamy doctor, portrayed by Patrick Wilson. In regards to Patrick Wilson's character, Adam, there's also been a lot of controversy around his character and his actions with another character, Natalia. Even though they are just characters, if you watch the scene, it's incredibly clear that Adam doesn't actually care about Natalia's consent. When Lena does address it, she says she doesn't believe that what Adam did constituted rape and that, quote, to me, it seemed like a terrible miscommunication between two people who didn't know what they really wanted, end quote. If you ask me, I think it's clear that Natalia's character didn't actually want to be with Adam because she says, look, I didn't take a shower today as a way to say she's not ready. And I really didn't like that when it ended. I do think that this is an important conversation to be had at the very least. This shows how important giving and receiving clear consent is when it comes to a relationship. Whether or not you liked or disliked the show, there's no denying that it won and was nominated for a ton of awards and it sparked conversation. Personally, while I think it may have been progressive in some areas, it fell remarkably short in others. For example, Donald Glover's character Sandy in season two was largely seen as the token black character that made the show accepting. 
Lena's character, Hannah, also claims to not see color while Sandy tells her, that's insane, it's part of who I am. I agree with Sandy. However, Dunham continued to only cast people of color when race seemed to define their character. Sandy was the only character of color who played any substantial role for four whole seasons. And let me remind everyone that this show took place in Brooklyn, a borough of New York City that is two thirds people of color. And yet the only time Dunham cast people of color was when she wanted them as nannies, homeless people, or to have an Asian character that was good with computers. However, the show is only the beginning of this rabbit hole. This is how Lena Dunham got her start, but it's not at all the only or even largest reason why people continue to be upset with her to this day. According to a Fast Company article a few years ago, back in January of 2013, Lena Dunham was a Fast Company cover star, one of the most creative people in business that year. She shared the space with benefactor Judd Apatow, who had correctly sensed from her debut film, Tiny Furniture, that Dunham may be a hit TV show in her. Just a year after the ubiquitously blogged about girls premiered, Dunham seemed to have the world in the palm of her hand. Whichever controversy du jour surrounded her at any given moment, propelling her show even more incredibly into the public eye. In the nearly six years since, however, Fast Company has watched as the situation has reversed with Dunham's creative projects consistently overshadowed by the controversy that follows her every utterance. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these utterances and why they're far more than just problematic and who Lena Dunham is as a businesswoman today. Rather than try to keep track of every single one of her frustrating statements on a timeline that would inevitably be all over the place, I'm going to sort of section things off and talk about how she's handled sexual assault allegations against coworkers and things of that nature. Then her comments about race, how she's treated animals, the projects and businesses she has worked on, you kind of get the picture, but we're gonna go ahead and start off real heavy with the comments on sexual assault. One man Dunham is close with, Marie Miller, wrote Girls in 2017 and was accused of sexually assaulting actress Aurora Perino. She claims to have woken up to him raping her after a night of socializing when she was 17 and she didn't consent to it in any way. Whether or not Dunham believed Aurora doesn't matter. She deserves to be heard for her case to be taken seriously too and investigated like any other woman that steps forward. And yet, as the news broke, Lena Dunham stated that she was confident the accusation had been misreported. Is that so, Lena? What is it that made you so confident? Were you there? Were you with Miller that night? Well, in Lena's first statement, she actually does claim to be, and along with her co-star, Jenny Connor, wrote, "'While our first instinct is to listen to every woman's story, our insider knowledge of Murray's situation makes us confident that sadly, this accusation is one of the 3% of assault cases that are misreported each year,' they said. "'It is a true shame to add to that number as outside of Hollywood, women still struggle to be believed. We stand by Murray, and this is all we will be saying about this issue.'" Well, as it turns out, that was a lie. She had no insider knowledge, none whatsoever, but lied to discredit Aurora. This is undoubtedly one of the worst things I think she's done. It's not some drama. This is an alleged crime. I know it's absolutely devastating to think that someone you're close to may be friends with who could be capable of such a thing. And I'm not saying that Lena Dunham needed to come out, call him guilty and start bashing Miller. The case was ongoing. Therefore, no one, not the victim or accused should be discredited. It's so difficult for victims of this type of crime to step forward because of the scrutiny they come under after going through such a traumatic event. Lena Dunham can't call herself a feminist and then go around making these types of lies to defend someone she simply can't know if they're innocent or not. I will say that primarily due to the statute of limitations, as well as some inconsistencies in victim, suspect, and witness statements, the case did not move forward. So I've got absolutely no idea what happened here. And as such, I don't think Aurora should be called a liar. Lena did apologize later, stating, "'Every woman who comes forward deserves to be heard fully and completely, and our relationship to the accused should not be part of the calculation anyone makes when examining her case.'" 
Stephanie found this very hollow though, especially when you consider that only a few months before, she tweeted that women don't lie about rape, standing with the many women stepping forward in the wake of the Me Too movement. It's just an extremely hypocritical moment in her history where she says women don't lie and wants to appear like an ally or progressive, then the moment someone she knows is accused, her stance changes. After all, Len has gone on and on about how important it is to listen to women when Bill Cosby was accused of raping women, and yet she won't listen to Aurora? How can the same person lie to discredit Aurora also state, I feel like women just not being listened to is what's the scariest. Bill Cosby is just a symbol for a situation that's so obvious, and yet people don't stand up and say, this is crazy, we should do something about it. Even now, people resist it, even when Cosby says he gave them quaaludes. I still get tweets every day where people are like, innocent until proven guilty. Hell, she even went so far as to say that when people told her she was obsessed with the case, it was like saying she was obsessed with the Holocaust. I agree with Refinery29's take on this as they state. Dunham makes a strong statement here. We tend to look the other way and give powerful men a free pass to abuse that power and often discredit the women making claims against them. It's a huge problem and comparing suffering is never an easy analogy to make, but it's troublesome to draw lines to mass genocide. All in all, I understand why this Miller Aurora situation made so many people furious with Dunham. Do not pretend to stand by anyone if the moment the belief is tested, you're going to turn your back on them. That's really shitty. But as we'll soon see, this is in fact a pattern for Lena Dunham and she makes infuriating, tone deaf, harmful comments only to apologize and then continue making those comments. However, one of the biggest scandals in this vein of sexual assault is what Lena Dunham admitted to doing to her younger sister in her book, Not That Kind of Girl. Here are just a few passages from her book. I shared a bed with my sister, Grace, until I was 17 years old. She was afraid to sleep alone and would begin asking me around 5 p.m. every day whether she could sleep with me. I put on a big show of saying no, taking pleasure in watching her beg and sulk, but eventually I always relented. Her sticky, muscly body thrashed beside me every night as I read Anne Sexton, watched reruns of SNL, sometimes even as I slipped my hand into my underwear to figure some stuff out. Passage two reads, "'Do we all have uteruses?' I asked my mother when I was seven. "'Yes,' she told me, "'we're born with them and with all our eggs, "'but they start out very small, "'and they aren't ready to make babies until we're older.'" I looked at my sister, now a slim, tough one-year-old, and her tiny belly. I imagined her eggs inside her, like a sack of spider eggs in Charlotte's Web, and her uterus, the size of a thimble. Does her vagina look like mine? I guess so, my mother said, just smaller. One day, as I sat in our driveway in Long Island, playing with blocks and buckets, my curiosity got the best of me. Grace was sitting up, babbling and smiling, and I leaned down between her legs and carefully spread open her vagina. She didn't resist, and when I saw what was inside, I shrieked. My mother came running. Mama, mama, Grace has something down there. My mother didn't bother asking why I had opened Grace's vagina. This was within the spectrum of things that I did. She just got on her knees and looked for herself. It quickly became apparent that Grace had stuffed six or seven pebbles in there. My mother removed them patiently while Grace cackled, thrilled that her prank had been a success. As for the passage three, it states, as Grace grew, I began bribing her for her time and affection. One dollar in quarters if I could do her makeup like a motorcycle chick. Three pieces of candy if I could kiss her on the lips for five seconds. Whatever she wanted to watch on TV, if she would just relax on me. Basically, anything a sexual predator might do to woo a small suburban girl I was trying. Really what I wanted beyond affection was to feel that she needed me, that she was helpless without her big sister leading her through the world. I took a perverse pleasure in delivering bad news to her, the death of our grandfather, a fire across the street, hoping that her fear would drive her into my arms, would make her trust me. First of all, the amount of times I nearly threw up reading those three passages is just good Lord. But the other thing is, if Lena Dunham was denouncing her behavior as a growing child who was touching her sister inappropriately, I may not have made such a massive issue about this, although it's still really fucking weird. 
But what's incredibly messed up here is not only was she sharing a bed until she was 17, which is obviously old enough to understand that what she was doing was wrong, but she was using her younger sister for sexual pleasure. And she defended her actions to people and said that the stories of her molesting her sister are upsetting and disgusting. You know what's also disgusting, Lena? Defending behavior that you yourself refer to as perverse. She has enough self-awareness to call her actions perverse, but the second she's called out on him, it's not fair. What's equally upsetting is that a lot of articles coming out around this time, particularly one from Vox, turns it into something political and how right-leaning politics accuse Dunham of molesting her sister, whereas the left criticizes her for rich white girl privilege. Like, what does that have to do with anything? This isn't about what conservatives think about her or what liberals think about her. It's about how Lena Dunham told the world she was touching her sister and then got angry when people called her out on it. Ready to glare, shout out to the homegirl, love her, what a doll. But anyway, uh, she talks about this situation specifically in one of her videos and it will be available in my sources if you want to see another take on this whole thing. And I think she did an excellent job on it. But in every single one of these passages from her book, Lena admits that she does. And yet, as far as I can tell, never says, this was messed up and I wish I learned about my sexuality at a younger age so I knew not to treat my sister this way. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe she says it later in the book, but judging from her reactions to being called out, I don't think so. Whether you call this abuse or not, whether you call it normal childhood development or not, I'm not a child psychologist, so I can't be the judge of that. But from my own perspective, all I can say is that I disagree with how this was handled and how this was presented. It could have been so easy to say, hey, my sister gave me consent to write this, which she did. I was exploring my sexuality at a young age, but I'm not trying to condone using younger siblings for that. I understand that these types of behaviors can also be done with malicious intent. You know, something along those lines, but that didn't happen. Lena Dunham has not only been accused of this, but hipster racism as well. The term was used by writer Zinzi Clemens. She stated, it's time for women of color, black women in particular, to divest from Lena Dunham. Zinzi Clemens tweeted, followed by a long statement in which she revealed that she has known Dunham since the two ran in the same circles in college. She said they had mutual acquaintances. Back in college, I avoided those people like the plague because of their well-known racism, she wrote. I'd call their strain hipster racism, which typically uses sarcasm as a cover. And in the end, it looks a lot like gaslighting. It's just a joke. Why are you overreacting? Is a common response to these types of statements. She claimed that one female in Lena's circles was known to use the N-word in conversation in order to be provocative. And if she was ever called on it, she would say, it's just a joke. I was often in the same room with her, but I never spoke to her, only watched her from far in anxiety and horror. Clemens left Lenny Letter, a weekly feminist letter created by Lena Dunham after Dunham lied to support Miller. More and more in recent years, as people have called out her show for racism and pretending to be this woke feminist program while having so few people of color in it, Lena Dunham has said that she was, quote, so busy thinking so much about representing weirdo and chubby girls and strange half Jews that she'd forgotten there was an entire world of women who were being underserved, end quote. For many though, her statements and apologies fall short, as they often do. In the 2016 at the Met Gala, she was seemingly upset that New York Giants wide receiver Odom Beckham Jr. wasn't paying attention to her. Lena Dunham wrote about how he paid her no attention and said that he probably determined she was not the shape of a woman by his standards. Not only is that a massive assumption to make, but one response by Preston Mitchum hit the nail on the head. Lena Dunham is upset because Odell Beckham Jr. didn't objectify her, but would she have been upset if he did? Based on nothing more than one look, Dunham assumed she knew everything that Odell Beckham was thinking. She didn't attempt to initiate conversation. He never said a word to her. As one source writes, maybe Beckham doesn't know who Dunham is. Maybe Beckham didn't feel like speaking to anyone. Maybe Beckham knew who she was and intentionally chose not to interact with her. All of these things are possible. But the only likely scenario that made sense to Dunham was that he wasn't attracted to her sexually because that is the only way that she saw him as a black buck there for her choosing who had somehow rejected her in her head. 
Slate, another news source that commented on this, got it horribly wrong by suggesting that perhaps Beckham is gay. First, Beckham's sexuality isn't an issue. Dunham's projection is. Further is the thought that any cis heterosexual black man in Dunham's presence would have been interested in her sexually. So perhaps Beckham is gay because he was not interested? She had just been grinding on Jordan, so that can't be the correct conclusion. Second, again, this isn't about black men. It's about Dunham's obsession with and the fetishization of them, which she is well aware. Dunham has literally written before that you could bounce a quarter off that butt when talking about Barack Obama, and I wish I was joking. She claims to be a feminist and yet doesn't see the hypocrisy in objectifying and sexualizing someone else, the president at the time no less. And then when a black man doesn't objectify her, she assumes it's because he doesn't see her as a real woman. Another tweet went out that hilariously says, it's ironic Lena Dunham said there aren't black people on her show cause she can't write them truthfully, but now she can read our minds. Even when she apologized to Odell, it was extremely victimizing, stating how she had so many insecurities about her body. She was surrounded by swan-like actresses and it was hard for her not to feel like a sack of flaming garbage. Dunham still hasn't learned that one of the massive issues people have with her is her hypocrisy, where she claims to stand against behavior that she herself takes part in. She complains that there isn't a single black member out of the 87 in the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, a valid criticism, but she claims it's her attraction to Drake that doesn't make her racist. And I'm not kidding. One source states, the more Dunham has spoken over the years, the more she has become the stock photo for white feminism, the highly suspect strand that cannot exist unless the white person in question is speaking about herself, no matter what the larger issue is. Dunham, in effect, cannot talk about abortion or racism unless she makes it about herself and annotates it with an example, no matter how inane, involving her. If you're wondering what the abortion remark is about, it's because she also has said in the past that she wished she had an abortion. Her apology for that was yet again to victimize herself and say her words were spoken from a delusional girl persona that she often inhabits. Also tried to get people to vote in 2012 by making a video called Your First Time where she compares voting to losing your virginity, trying to get the youth to vote, which again, crosses the line from questionable into what the fuck are you doing territory? There's also been controversy around her being hired to work on a Syrian film with this history, but I would say the issue here is with Spielberg and those that chose to hire her more than Dunham herself. According to my source, the movie is an adaptation of Melissa Fleming's A Hope More Powerful Than the Sea, one's refugee incredible story of love, loss, and survival. Melissa Fleming is currently the chief spokeswoman for the United Nations High Commissioner and Flatiron Books. Fleming wrote the book to document the story of a mother named Doa al-Zamel who fled Egypt with her two children, hoping to make it to Sweden by boat. Had it been any other writer in Hollywood, the news that a white American man or woman had written this movie would have been disappointing, but it most likely would have slipped under the radar. Steven Spielberg and co-producer J.J. Abrams could have picked literally any other writer for this project and avoided controversy. Lena Dunham has an extensive history of being publicly tactless, which most people are aware of. Because of this, people will be examining this production under the microscope in search of inaccuracies and fault. For that reason alone, it's a completely baffling decision on the part of Abrams and Spielberg. I can't necessarily blame Lena Dunham for taking the job, but I can sympathize with those that feel she wasn't at all the best choice for this project. Yet, aside from all the controversy around sexual abuse, racism, and some smaller one-off remarks she's made, we still got a lot more to talk about here. We're gonna get into how Lena Dunham talks about and treats animals. But before we jump into that, we're going to take a quick breather and thank today's sponsor for me being able to make this episode. Um, and I need, I need like a minor break just before we jump into this hellhole. Be healthy, find a work-life balance, improve our relationships. But have you thought about your hair goals? 
If you don't love your hair, then you need to break up with your current hair care routine right now. And it's time to try Function of Beauty instead. Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. Now, some of you may not know, but I actually used to bleach my hair. Like I was a ash platinum blonde for a very long time in my life. And that did severely damage my hair. So that's kind of why I went back to being a brunette. And after many years of kind of being a brunette again, sticking with my natural hair color and just vibing in my own lane, I definitely realized my hair is still a little bit dry and it definitely has some damage. So I like using products that are moisturizing and really help kind of lift my hair and give it a little bit of life. So it was kind of awesome that Function of Beauty gave me this really easy little quiz to take that everyone pretty much takes whenever you're picking out your hair formulation and you pick out what you need from your hair products, what you need your shampoo and conditioner to do for you. Then you pick your colors and your scents and then they bottle it up and package it and send it right to you. I picked out the minty green color and the peach scent. I know Oh, the color and the scent don't really go together, but like that's the beauty of Function of Beauty. You can do that and that's exactly what I've done. And you can choose to go fragrance, dye-free and silicone-free as well if that's something you're interested too. There are over 54 trillion possible formulations and Function of Beauty has over 50,000 five-star reviews as well. So if you wanna get started with Function of Beauty, make sure to go to functionofbeauty.com casket to take the quiz and save 20% on your first order. That applies to their full range of customized hair, skin, and body products. Go to functionofbeauty.com casket and let them know we sent you and get 20% off your first order. Again, functionofbeauty.com casket. Today's episode is also sponsored by Stitch Fix. Shopping for new clothing can be needlessly stressful. And for me, it definitely is. It can be daunting. You never know if things will really fit, returns are difficult, and you don't even know what store to start with or if they're even open or if it's even safe to go to that store right now still, honestly. So this season, let Stitch Fix do the hard work for you. Stitch Fix offers clothing hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. Every piece is chosen to your fit and your life, so it's an easy solution for finding what makes you look and feel your best. I've been using Stitch Fix on my own for almost a year now. So when they were like, yeah, we'll totally sponsor your videos. I was like, what? I was like, oh my God. I was like, holy hell, what do I do? This is such a big thing. Is it because you guys have been seeing all the fabulous shirts I've been buying from you guys? Cause I hope so. But honestly, some of my favorite sweaters have legitimately come from Stitch Fix. I like would have never thought of these brands. I would have never thought of these styles. And then it shows up in the box and somehow they just get it right. And I'm a sweater addict and they just hit the nail on the head for me. Like it, amazing. And with Stitch Fix, there's no subscription required. You can set your Stitch Fix up once or do an automatic delivery. And I do an automatic delivery for the record, but you don't have to do that. And all you do is every time a box gets shipped, it's a $20 fee. And then that gets credited towards any piece you keep. And there's no hidden fees whatsoever. So it's pretty easy. All you do is they ship you a box. There's a $20 fee attached to that. You receive your box. You look through all the items in it and the items you keep, that's obviously the ones you keep and they charge you for that. And then they have a prepaid shipping return label and you put the things you don't want in there and they don't charge you for those things that get returned. It's that easy. So if you wanna get started today, go to Stitch stitchfix.com slash casket and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Again, that's stitchfix.com slash casket for 25% off and you keep everything in your first fix. stitchfix.com slash casket. One article in 2017 reads, a couple of weeks ago, Lena Dunham revealed on Instagram that she had quietly and discreetly checked her rescue dog, Lambie, into the Zen Dog Canine Rehabilitation Center before the dog was eventually rehomed. She explained, Lambie suffered terrible abuse as a pup that made having him in a typical home environment dangerous to him and others. But now a spokesperson for the shelter in Brooklyn where Dunham got the dog is disputing her claims of abuse, saying Lambie was perfectly fine before she adopted him. Bark Shelter spokesperson Robert Vasquez told Yahoo in an email that the shelter checked the records for Lambie, whom Dunham had claimed in a New Yorker essay had three other homes, three other names before she rescued him. He was owner surrendered, not enough time. So we do not know where she got multiple owners that abused the dog, Vasquez wrote. Furthermore, at the time Lambie was adopted, the dog was almost two years old and did not have a history of aggression, according to the Bark rep. Vasquez, who has been in charge of dog adoption at the shelter for nearly 15 years, added that he was on site during the four times Lena visited Lambie before the adoption went through. If Lambie had a bad past or was abused, do you think Bark would have adopted him to Lena knowing she's a new star and put her or the dog in that situation, he wrote. We would have told her if the dog had issues. We are a no-kill shelters. We don't lie about the dog's histories because that's what gets them returned. And mentally, it's not good for dogs. 
The Bark spokesman went on to write, it's just hard to believe the dog was nasty when she took Lambie to every green room with her when girls was still a thing four years ago. He also criticized Dunham for recently getting two new dogs, which she brought with her to The Tonight Show in February. She didn't admit she brought her two new dogs despite writing in The New Yorker that dogs shouldn't be dumped or thrown away because they have feelings, he said. Lena replied to this on Instagram saying that Lambie's aggression was unpredictable and his issues weren't manageable, but after countless hours of training, endless financial support, and lots of tears, she gave him a better life. And okay, here's the thing. First of all, I'm finding it incredibly hard to be unbiased here. Myself and my main researcher, Ali, both have dogs that we adore and we are absolutely dog moms and cannot picture our lives without our sweet beans. So I will say that right up front, this makes me furious just coming from a, a biased place because I it's hard to be unbiased about something like this. Second of all, Even if her dog was aggressive, why bring him with you to the green room? If I had an aggressive dog, I wouldn't bring them to an environment that would stress them out and potentially hurt somebody or themselves. That dog wouldn't be coming anywhere in public with me, especially if the aggression was unpredictable, like she says. So even if you believe her, she's still an irresponsible dog owner in the fact that she was willingly endangering others by bringing him around if he was such a terrible aggressive dog. And third, I find it very, I I highly doubt that the shelter would lie about their version of events. Now, of course, I could be wrong as lies have happened before and recent laws in New York are being put in place, for example, to keep shelters from lying about a dog's history. But Bark does, generally speaking, have a pretty good reputation. So I, again, it's just another strike for Lena. Also, I don't want anyone walking away from this thinking that abused dogs are bound to remain aggressive because that's also simply not true. Many dogs can be aggressive after abuse because of fear, but abused dogs can love and trust again and are just as deserving of that love. Other sources do show that Lena Dunham tried to get Lambie help and she hired someone to treat her dog's aggression, which again, even if she did, then Lambie should not have been ever brought on set. Regardless of whose side of the story you're on, she's an irresponsible pet owner, no matter how you look at it. Now, there have been some other articles about how her Sphinx cat, Gia Marie, died pretty suddenly in 2018 and her 13-year-old dog passed away around the same time. People have been absolutely suspicious of Doe's deaths, but there doesn't seem to be any evidence whatsoever, so I'm not really going to speak on it because, hey, animals do pass away and I'm not gonna make a spectacle or something about it. I'm only bringing it up because it did come up a few times in my research and how people speculated if something more nefarious went on, but I can't find anything to conclude such events occurred. So let's move on. Now, as for what Lena Dunham's been up to these days and her companies, well, she's started her own plus size clothing line. The company she's working with is Eleven Honor, and this decision, unsurprisingly, is already facing a ton of backlash, according to one source. On May 31st, 2020, plus size retailer Eleven Honor made a statement outlining how actions speak louder than words. The brand emphasized the importance of community, especially in regard to uplifting black voices within the plus size space where POC are often excluded from the narrative. Now, 10 months later, the brand's latest launch and first ever celebrity partnership with Lena Dunham is speaking volumes. Why didn't they take the time to do some research or reach out to other people who might have been a better fit for this? Writer and brand consultant Liz Black tells Nylon. Dunham's original tease of the launch back on March 26 was initially met with favorable comments on social media, likely because of her relatable caption. When you're thin, no matter the reason, there's a kind of inherent nod of congratulations that comes from being able to fit into runway staples and look a part of a Hollywood starlet, she wrote on Instagram. And while some designers have embraced my plus size body, there's always the inherent implication by others that by doing so, they have bravely risen into some kind of challenge and that I'm brave for simply coming out in this body dressed in a way that doesn't hide in shame. A notable message for sure, but enough to cover up Dunham's controversy within the plus size community? For many, the answer is a resounding no. 
Lena Dunham has talked at length in interviews about her body and how she's always gained weight in her stomach, especially after going through early menopause, and that's not where people want to see flesh. She says that the media wants curvy bodies like Kim Kardashian, but sized up, big butts and breasts, but without cellulite. As Nylon points out, Dunham hasn't really shown appreciation for the plus size fashion community before, so why would she be given this privilege? Eleven Honor made a concentrated effort in the wake of the BLM movement to uplift more black voices. So why not uplift plus size voices that aren't as problematic as Lena Dunham? The thing is for this specific case, I'm trying to see both sides here. On one hand, I know that she was very open with her body on girls, bearing it all and showing that, hey, all bodies deserve to be celebrated. Yet at the same time, the inclusive site, as they call it, has a range of 12 to 24, which sort of excludes, well, a bunch of sizes. Inclusive fashion should actually include every body type, as one article states, mentioning smart glamour, which has sizes ranging from extra, extra small to 15X. The article also states, Dunham says in the Times interview that her body has settled around a 14, 16. Considering the average American woman is typically stated to be a size 16, Dunham size is, well, just that, average. Plus sized, but just barely. By the entertainment industry's standards, Dunham might be considered fat. I do not doubt for a moment that she has felt the vociferous backlash of being a larger body in an industry that seems to consider plus size when they're a mere size eight. In her personal and professional world, Dunna may be the biggest one in a lot of rooms, but there's still no denying that compared to many of us, she benefits from tremendous privilege where her size is concerned, even if she can't see it. If Lena Dunham wasn't so controversial, then I don't think I'd be having such mixed feelings. Her intentions might be good, at least she's not hurting anyone specific, but I don't, but she is at the same time. It's hard to say that really. And honestly, I absolutely understand why people wouldn't want her as the face of a community after everything she's done. I certainly wouldn't want her representing me in any sort of facet. So now comes the big question, is she sorry? Well, I can't say because I'm not her, but it doesn't really feel that way. As much as she's full of apologies, they all seem hollow. Even when her show was released, it was criticized for its lack of diversity. So her comments about how she forgot an underserved community doesn't hold water. She was called out for it, neglected to change. So why should anyone believe she'd change now? She hasn't learned, or at least she hasn't really shown that she has because these issues are continuous. Although some of these statements could be chalked up to complete ignorance and stupidity, the one with Aurora was far more malicious and intentional. Obviously, it's up to you to decide if she should be forgiven for it. It's up to her fans to either sweep it under the rug or, you know, stop supporting her for it. Personally, I feel like every time I see her name trending or in the news, I just roll my eyes and think, what stupid thing has she done now? She's far, far from the worst person I've covered in these episodes, but considering that we talked about literal serial killers, child abusers, and cult leaders, there's a pretty high standard around here to be considered one of the worst. She recently launched a production company called Good Thing Going Productions, and I guess something's coming out of that, but I don't have a ton of hope it's gonna be anything actually positive. But with all of that being said, that's where we are going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date with all the recent episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to follow my Linktree link. Click on that bad boy in the description box and it's gonna give you a nice organized list of all the projects I'm involved in and all of my social media. So again, thank you all for making it to another corporate casket. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.